Sorry? Where's Mr. Southall? He's stuck on a tube. He's on his way, though. Okay, guys, morning. <laughs> I'm just giving you your five-minute warning. We're doing our usual, we'll start a little bit after everybody else gig. Um, partially because Ben's stuck on a tube as well. So he'll be here soon. Um, it's nice to see so many familiar faces, though. Hands up if, if you've been to pretty much every session we've held. Get in. Right. Take a few minutes, guys. We'll be with you shortly. Okay, guys, we're going to kick off. Um, final day, final two sessions. Obviously, this morning we've got um, a session just about the business basics. So we've talked to you all week about things like how to network brilliantly, how to pitch your business, um, how to attract investment. One of the things that I see quite a lot through Wira is actually there's very little often talked about in startup land about actually the core business skills that you need to actually knit your entire business together and, and genuinely make it fly. There's a lot of talk about technology and a lot of talk about networking and, and how to pitch, but not enough to teach you about how to write a business plan. What is a marketing plan? What other things do you need in place to be able to actually make sure that your business can run brilliantly? Um, and I'm delighted to say that we have our Wira UK, um, London Academy Director here, Charmaine Egbury. She's been running the Academy now for six months. Six, months. six whole months, yeah. Um, and before that, um, Charmaine's been Director of many, many global multinational corporates. So has <laughs> absolutely bucket loads of experience to share with you on this. So welcome, Charmaine. Hello, thank you. You love being the first session in the morning, right? And then someone says that you're going to stand on stage and I'm going to tell you how to write a business plan. And I go, ah, oh, yes, where's my coffee? Have I run to Starbucks? Do I really want to do the session today? So what I'm going to talk to you about is less how to write a business plan and to talk to you about those skill sets that we're looking for in entrepreneurs who come into Wira. 
And I also don't want to spend, this a two-hour session, I really don't want to spend the whole morning spewing PowerPoint slides at you about all the uh, attributes that an entrepreneur needs. So what I am going to do is break the session up essentially into three separate sessions. One, I'm going to talk to you about the skills that we're looking for, a bit about Wira, and the things that we look for also in CEOs of startups who want to come into Wira. And very specifically, I'm going to start talking about the criteria that Wira looks for in companies. The hard skills, the soft skills, those things that we're going to look for if you're going to apply to Wira. Then we're going to break it up, and I'm actually going to have one of our Wira startups who's in our current cohort, and he's sitting here in the front, Jonathan, and he's just got in. He's been with us now 19 weeks, I think, and he's going to talk to you a bit about the experiences that he went through. We'll make that interactive, so Ben Southworth is going to come in and ask us both questions about what it's like to be in an accelerator and essentially judge a startup coming in. And then also for the startup themselves, the experience they went through, how they prepped, what they thought was important, and to give you both sides of the story of what it takes to be an entrepreneur coming into an accelerator in a nine-month period. And thereafter, I'm going to open it up to Q&A, because more importantly than just listening to what I have to tell you, I want to hear what your questions are. I've just been told that we have three tickets, is that right, for the Clipper? Uh, so apparently I have to give them out to the best questions that get asked in the morning. The next question I got asked was, yes, does that come with alcohol? And I said, I don't know, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. If you want alcohol, let me know. But uh, yeah, apparently I have these three. So it's either the best question on the day or the person I like most. I'm going to go with the one about Q&A and the best question, because I like too many of you in the audience. All right, so should we get going? Good. Interactive, please. Don't let me bore you too much with slideware. If you want to stop halfway and ask me a question, raise your hand. Seriously, please do. That's how I want the session to work, and that's particularly key to the spirit of how Wira works too. So you all know about Wira, and you've all had a very interesting week from what I can tell. So this is what you've been going through. Pitching, investments, how to network. You've had all of these different presentations from Wira so far. And the idea behind them was to give you some of the building blocks that are necessary for you to be a successful entrepreneur. What we're going to talk about now, and I will introduce you a little bit to Wira because it does set up the scene for why I'm going to talk about the things that I think are important for you coming in. Because Wira is a very different kind of accelerator. Firstly, it's the largest global accelerator on the planet. We have 13, soon to be 14 academies around the world. No one else has that breadth of accelerators on the planet today. They accommodate anything from 10 to 20 different startups. We all, however, look for the same things. So whether you are coming in with 10, we're coming in with 20 teams into London, and I will talk just now about the next and very new exciting accelerator that we're going to open. But each one of us looks for the same core skill sets. So Wire, firstly, is very, very different from the other accelerators out there for a number of key things. Firstly, the amount of time that you come in for is typically up to nine months. We give you money, yes. We give you an access to Telefonica and potentially to over 300 million consumers that Telefonica supports across the globe. And if you add in China and our relationships there, it's almost over a billion people that you could have access to as a company. So you're not just coming in for money, you're not just coming in for a network, you're not just coming in for mentors and board advisors, you're coming in essentially also to get a really head start on reaching your target consumer, whether they be B2B or B2C. Because very seldom do you find a company that can give you that kind of global outreach. So that's what you have. The other thing that we bring in is we bring a sense of family. Now, that's going to sound like a strange word from a commercial investor. But the one thing that we have learned throughout our period of time running Wira is that the thing that matters most is community. The thing that you will learn most is from each other. So we pick the companies that come in and the people that we support incredibly carefully. We make sure that you give back to the community, that you're willing to share. If someone brings you a card and says, hey, this investor might be interested in you, and we find out that they're not, that you give that business card to the company sitting next to you, that you're prepared to do that. If they ask you, who, do you know anyone who could develop something like this, or do you have a contact over here, you're willing to share. So community and the sense of belonging to family is super, super, super important to Wira. And interestingly enough, we've also learned it's very important to your future success as an entrepreneur. The ability to give back. Not to just do this and say, it's my company, it's all mine, I will only focus on this one thing to the detriment of everything else. But your ability to contribute to your community is vitally important, one of the core skill sets that we value when you come into Wira. This is the space in London. I want to share with you where we work. It's beautiful. It's designed very cleverly to be about the entrepreneur and not actually about the wireless staff. 
So, for example, the teams get all the best space in the entire building. They get the big windows. They get the great light. They get to have pods or uh, their own office. We call them pods, but that's their own office with their own working space. They get to have fun, yes. You'll notice the fridges, the discussion about alcohol earlier. Yes, it's good and important to let your hair down. We all know that. You can't just work. You do have to have some play. But very importantly, this entire building and the entire way that Wira works has been very, very carefully thought through to make the best environment for the entrepreneur and their company. So it's free flow. It makes people talk to each other. It makes people share. It makes them listen to each other. It makes them collaborate throughout. A few more examples. Modern, light, etc. And yes, ping pong tables. And yes, all the other good things, just so you make sure you can have fun. The interesting thing about being an entrepreneur is you have to be adaptable. That's actually not a ping pong table. It's a boardroom table. That's been adapted. It's a small example, a very small example, the kind of agility of thinking that you're going to see when you come into Wire. So, a little bit about the commercials. 90% of our startups have already launched. Now, a lot of people ask me this question of, do I have to have a fully baked business? Do I have to have an, is it enough to have just an idea coming in? Is it enough to just have a business plan? What do I need coming in? And 90% of our businesses now have gone from good idea and they're already launched. And launched in some surprising places. So we've got teams that were initially focused on the West Coast and they now find themselves big in Japan. You know, in other places, we are finding that Wira's outreach is well beyond the United Kingdom. So most of our companies have launched. Most of them are already selling. Very important in startup land, are you making money? Can you pay the bill? All of, most of them are selling already. That's a very, very big number. So this isn't just something that's in incubator mode, that's in stealth mode, that people don't know anything about. Most of them are selling. And very importantly, a lot of them are already partnering with Telefonica. A lot of them. For example, we have two startups right now in London. How many of you know that O2 has just launched their 4G network? Great, brilliant. Two of the wireless startups are actually behind that 4G launch. One of them is a team of just two people. And those two people have designed a system whereby they're actually training the 4G operators. That's 9,000 people across O2. And they today won the contract, and it is a revenue generating contract. So I have to make that clear. It wasn't just, hey, you're in Wire, give it to us for free, thanks very much. It's a revenue generating contract for them to train the O2 staff by gamification. So they've designed a gamification system to make that happen. It's one. Another one is Eventstagram, where you get to tweet your experience of 4G, and that comes up. Go and have a look at both these companies. First one called Jolly Deck, the next one called Eventstagram. The point there is we're actively, actively looking for opportunities to support our startups, both via O2, both via Telefonica. So good news all around there. And from an investment front, because we all worry about money, right? We want to know, can I get investment? Will my company be successful? It's not enough to sell. I have to get investment. And so, at the moment, we have about 273 companies across the wire network. Our next call opens in three weeks. Three weeks. And very soon, that number will go up to 300. And before I know it, we'll be at 500. We are actively investing in a very, very broad breadth of companies across the globe actively investing. There isn't a typical kind of company we're going to look for. We don't just look for cloud. We're not just looking for dating. We're not just looking for gamification. We're looking for diversity. We want diversity of thought, diversity of the business, diversity of business model. We actively are supporting all of that across the globe. 20,000 businesses applied to BNWIRA. 20,000. 21,000 actually now. That's a massive number. And that's why I said the rest of my presentation will talk about why did we pick the 17 that we currently have in London rather than 20? What do we look for in you, very importantly, and what do we look for in your business when you compete against 20,000 other businesses across the globe to get into the accelerator in London? So, before I get there, final point, we don't just look for commercial enterprises. So I'll go back in here. We've just opened, we'll open on Monday morning. So the reason we all look as harassed as we do and running around like this is because we're very excited to announce our next academy opens in London on Monday morning at 9 o'clock. And it's called Wira Unlimited. And it is the very first accelerator that is dedicated to companies that are in digital that have a social purpose. They give something back. And very importantly, they not only give something back, they make money. I know that's a very unheard of thing. Most people will think of that pure play as charity, but these are commercial enterprises that are going to be measured on their social impact, and we've chosen 10 teams 
from around the globe. They'll join us on Monday morning for boot camp. They're starting then. And it's our, very, it's our 14th academy across the globe, something we're very, very excited about. And that's the space. We're busy literally cleaning it out, painting it up, putting up staircases, talking about coffee machines and other things, which I won't bore you about today. But very exciting across the globe. So that's the space. And this is the current team that we have in WIRA for 2013, one of whom, actually several of whom are in the audience here today. So once I finish talking, you can go over and ask them if everything I've said this morning is actually true about what we were looking for. But they're all here today and all doing incredibly well. Let me give you some examples of these companies. One is iHelp, and this, the reason I picked this is to show you the kind of diversity we have in London. iHelp is a company that looks uh, essentially as an alarm system for heart attacks. It was started by a gentleman who had two heart attacks before he was 24. Two. And now he's designed a system that can find you the nearest defibrillator, that can find the people that are trained to do CPR and others, and can alert the hospital at the same time, all using tech. It's both a hardware play and a software play. And he is not an entrepreneur who's who originally is from London. He's actually from Slovenia. Because again, we're looking for the very best digital startups around the world, not just ones that are homegrown right here. You have to be able to compete globally. Datch, you would have heard from Datch earlier in the week. And this is a dating site, but a dating site with a difference. Whereas it's a dating site that's only focused on women with a security system that makes sure that you are a woman when you say you are a woman. I know that sounds mad, but apparently 25% of online profiles, if not more, are men pretending to be women. And the lengths that they go to to pretend that they're women are quite frightening and quite amusing at the same time. So it is a closed network for women who want to meet other women and or and you would have heard from Robin earlier in the week. Again, we're actively embracing diversity in every single possible way we can. We think this is a very clever system. Go car share, giving something back, making people give up their company car, give up uh, their own personal car and or share. And they're working both with corporates or those folks like you who want to go to festivals and other. Why pay for your own car to get there when four of you can go together? Very clever system, booking system, currently live. They just closed the last funding round with Cedars. So I think it closed this week with 100% funding. Very interesting model. Sponsorcraft, you'll hear from Jonathan later. And he's changing the way that people give money back to the universities. It's just signed a massive deal. I may steal your thunder a bit, Jonathan, but he signed a massive deal with the world's biggest reseller of education software called Blackboard. I'll let him tell you all about that earlier. We're very excited on his behalf. Removal Stars, they've just rebranded the company as BuzzMove, but they're changing the moving industry. That industry that everyone looks at and goes, goodness sake, can there not be an easier way to do this? Really? Do I have to go to 15 different sites? Where's my money supermarket.com for the moving industry? How do I make this easy? So again, the point, you go from dating to moving to giving money to universities to heart attacks and more. And last two, TV, because we all like to watch it, but there's too much on at the moment and too many ways to access entertainment. So Tank Top TV has figured out a system of aggregating all of that around you. And because you're here this week, Tank Top TV has also got a code, which is WIRA UK, and if you go on, you can use it for free. And it takes all the different media sources that you have, figures out what you like to watch, and will then stream that for you. So all of you after this need to go and actually please download Tank Top TV and have a look. And then last but not least, EI Tech. Emotion sensing on your mobile phone. It's an algorithm that runs in the background that can be used to diagnose your mood. It can tell you whether you're happy, sad, whether they should push advertising to you about one thing or another, it can go into your journal and it has multiple uses. Right now, we're looking at it from an academic perspective, how to actually look at depression and how to analyze that so people can look at the right levels of medication and others. The military is interested in this to monitor mental health of their teams. But think about it from a marketing perspective. Wouldn't it be great that I know that when you're talking so-and-so, that makes you happy? And when you put the phone down, I should be sending you an advert that looks at this. Because guess what? Your propensity to buy immediately thereafter is greatly enhanced. Very interesting tech. Part of why I often say I think I have the best job in the world, because these are the kinds of companies I get to work with every single day and more. And hopefully some of you. I'll skip through the rest. So core business skills that we're looking for. What makes these companies really, really special? And I'm going to put up a warning. So this slide is more my warning slide, guys, which is I'm not going to give you a list of things that if you don't have, you will never be successful. OK, so let me just say that right now. There is no such thing. And I swear, every business book that I ever read in the world says, if you can't sell your debt, if you can't do marketing, you're this. Yes, you can go and outsource them. Yes, you can go and find people who are world class to do that. 
The trick is knowing what you don't know. Knowing that you have to go out and find those people. Knowing how to find them at the same time. Super important. So the warning, the first slide here is a warning. Yes, you can outsource all of this stuff. The problem that you're going to have if you don't have any basic knowledge of some of these things is you won't know the right questions to ask. You won't know what good looks like. You won't know what great looks like. And when someone walks to the door and tells you that they are a marketing expert, you will just take their word at it. And you won't know. And for your business, if you're a startup, you're going to learn that the hard way. So what you have to do with the skills that I'm going to outline is you have to learn the basics so that you can ask the right questions. Fair health warning? OK. Great. Good. I get a thumbs up in the back, which is always good. All right. Strange one to put up is number one, client management. You all have to be in charge of customer service. And everyone goes, customer service? What the heck is she talking about? I'm in digital. I'm just going to put it out on the web, and who cares? Well, guess what? Everybody cares, because you're in an immediate environment, and word of mouth matters. And if you give great service, and if you're constantly in dialogue in a personable way, your business grows exponentially. And the founders do not get to delegate this to other people. You do not get to delegate this, because you and your personality matter. So client management and keeping people happy and engaged in your business, super important. And if you're not a people person, I suggest you become one. You've got to make people feel they have a sense of belief in your company. Client management, number one. Sales, and notice I make them different. Client management is one thing. Selling is another. You have to be able to sell. You've got to be able to close a deal. You've got to be comfortable asking for the deal. And again, if you're not, go find someone who is. But I have two kinds of businesses in Wire today, and it's quite interesting. One of them has a massive pipeline of businesses. I mean, they have over 130 corporations who want to do business with them today. Problem? They don't have anyone who's asking for the sale or who's closing it. It's a unique problem for a startup to have. I have too much business opportunity, whereas I generally walk into companies who are struggling to find customers. So that's why I put sales second. It's the, sec the single most important thing you do. Find someone who can close the deal and open the deal. But make sure you're asking for the business at all times, because money matters. Yeah. 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 Basically, on the sales side, do not be shy. Don't be shy. Do not just sit there, ring once, and go. Well, I've, I've rung them once now. I'll, I'll let them call me back. Hell no. Keep ringing. Keep ringing some more. And then if they've still not picked up the phone, go visit them. You have to be persistent. I remember one of the very first startups we had in London. Um, we asked the startup how, the, how their sales were going. And the CEO said to me, oh, yeah, they've not rung me back. I said, you'd be waiting a long time, love. They won't ring you. You've got to make sure yeah. that you keep on being persistent. It's probably one of the things, and if, hands up if you're a British person, Brits, yeah, we're shit at this. We are dreadful. We're so polite and so nice, we don't want to intrude. Sod that, intrude. Yeah, intrude away. Thanks, Anne, that's good. <laughs> Great point, go ahead. I'll repeat your question back, if that's okay. I think that's not working. Yes, yeah, okay, so it works. Yeah. Um, so I guess, for me, mm. I mean, so I'm going to see clients mm -hmm. and I'm going to see the venues. So these are really prestigious venues and, you know, I've been able to get through the door mm -hmm. and it's great. Um, and they're pretty much sort of geared on to sign yeah. up for the terms and conditions. Now, because we're a startup, we're mm -hmm. having to write our own legal documentations. Um, and what I found as a stumbling block yeah. Yeah. is sort of like being really eager. But then as you go away and you're waiting for the form to be signed, that's the really big stumbling block and it's sort of trying to get through to the venue and I'm calling and I'm emailing and you know okay. with a lot and it's it's very sort of um I guess on their side mm -hmm. they're very polite in mm -hmm. terms of saying look we still want to do business with yep. you but I think there is something wrong with the terms and conditions I don't yeah. know but well it's an interesting it's thing because there's multiple things that could be happening one of the things we train people on is find out that there are two people in businesses and you have to deal with both the first one is the guy who says he has the budget, and mm. there's actually the other person who really does and signs it off. Yeah. And you typically have two, particularly in big corporates. Yeah. Now, this person over here will talk to you about the terms and conditions mm. and all those great things. What you have to find is who cuts the check. Because mm. sometimes the person, very often the person who cuts the check doesn't execute the thing you're offering. 
So this is your influencer over here. Find out who this person is. Mm. Start asking questions like that. Because yeah. what you'll find is that will also close. I mean, I'd say yeah. it's one solution to your issue. Depends on the company. Yeah. But one of the things we will work with with those companies is trying to figure out what's the lever. Look at your T's and C's. I, d I would sincerely doubt there's something in there that is very material unless they've given you that feedback directly. Mm. But what Anne said earlier is important. Keep yeah. at it. Yeah. Keep at it. Keep at it. One of the companies we deal with took 18 months to close a deal. But when they did, what a spectacular deal for them to do. But they kept at it. They didn't give up. My other advice to you would be when you're chasing and back saying, what else do you need? from me to be able to close this. Mm. Is there anybody yeah. else that I can talk to to influence this decision for you? How else can I help you? Basically, if you offer them help to get the good deal closed, that often helps you to get it over yeah. the line as well. Yeah, okay, good question. You may get one of these cards, it's a great question. Making things, I know that's a strange list, but if you're in digital and you're an entrepreneur, at the very least have some understanding of how the people and the developers working for you are going to code, are going to deliver. And if you're not a coder, be innately interested in what they do. You have to be able to understand how to make things. Again, I'm not suggesting you have to be the coder. You do not have to be the business expert, but you have to be able to ask the right questions. And there are many simple things you can go and do, many simple courses you can do to try and get this done. Measuring things. It's not enough to say, but I made money. I challenge any of you to go to an investor and say, but I made money. And the next word that's going to come out their mouth is, what are the metrics? Where are the metrics? What are you measuring? And do you know how to measure the right things? And the point is not about an arbitrary exercise of an Excel spreadsheet spitting out numbers. It's because what you measure changes what you do with your business. And if you're measuring the right things and interrogating the right things, you'll know what to do next. Each time you pull out a report each week, you'll be going, hmm, my company's not moving where I want to because these numbers that I'm seeing don't make sense to me. The story behind the number matters more in many cases than the number itself. I'll give an example. Startup on a Friday afternoon decides they're going to try something for free instead of charging for their product. They're yeah, probably, mm, I'm going to not pick these numbers. Maybe I should. I'll make some numbers up for you. Let's say they're at 2,000 downloads because they've been charging for a premium product. They're measuring that, that's great. Then they decide to try and experiment. What would happen if it's free? And by Monday morning, they have 30,000 downloads. What are they measuring? What are they looking at? Because for a month, they've been looking at these numbers every day, saying downloads look good, because in my previous company, I was getting 10 a day, and now I'm getting 11. That's not the right question to ask, guys. It's how should I be getting to this? What can I do to affect that number? It's the metrics. What are you measuring and why? And what are you going to do thereafter? That really matters. It's something I see a lot of entrepreneurs actually miss out completely because they're too interested in coding. They're too interested in making something. And they're too interested also in that small revenue number that they're chasing. They're not interested in measurement and all of these basics. So very important for you to go and have a look at. Communication. Talk, talk, talk some more. Sell, sell, sell some more. Stand on stage, talk to people. Get out there and sell your message. If you're not a natural communicator, go get some lessons from people who can help you. We use a gentleman who actually was an actor, and he now comes in as a presentation coach, and he helps our teams pitch. He teaches you how to breathe and to how to feel comfortable, how to stand anywhere, talk to anyone, and not freak out in your head, and not to have that sense of jitter. Communication matters, and it's not just external communication, it's also internal. Talk to your, your teams. Tell them what you want to achieve. Make sure that your vision is clear. So communication matters. And management is closely linked to that. It's a funny old thing, but everyone thinks of management as a corporate thing. Oh, it's management. It's always suits. Must sit in corner office. Must have big mahogany table. You know, must go to plenty of meetings, and eventually when I'm super successful, fly around in a jet. That's not management, guys. What I'm talking about here is can you get your people to be focused on your singular vision, keep them happy, make sure they're remunerated, you've picked the right people, which is the next one, have you got them all marching in the same direction? Management matters and you have to become a good manager very early on. It is not enough just to be a technical genius. Not enough because people make businesses. Not just product, people make businesses. Recruitment. Do you know how many businesses and people I run into, and I include myself, who say, I'm too busy to find other people to come and help me. I can't afford the time. I'm too busy. 
or I don't know what the right person is to go and hire. We've had startups, we've actually lent them people so they could get through the exercise of understanding what it takes to hire people and manage them. So they learned that. But you'd be surprised how many people are, are actually afraid and or are not comfortable with recruitment. And remember, it is actually better not to hire anyone than to hire the wrong someone. Golden rule number one, it really matters who you have in your company. Really matters. So focus your attention. And if you are a CEO, I challenge you now, do not delegate that to anyone. It is your decision to take about the culture that you're creating in your company and the people that you want in your company. Do not delegate this to anyone, ever. So, last one, marketing, branding, PR. The digital world, PR matters, it matters hugely, and there are multiple ways in which to do this. Again, you do not need to be an expert, but having an innate understanding of how to talk to your consumer and reach out to them really, really matters. That, that startup that I talked about that got to 30,000 downloads, the second trigger of their business was that someone wrote an article about them that was syndicated here in the UK, and someone in Japan picked it up on the Friday afternoon, and I think it was 3.45. That article went out, very unexpected, UK-focused journalist writing a UK-focused piece, got syndicated in Japan, boom. Next minute we are big in Japan. Understand how to use the power of marketing and PR, vitally important to your business. Right, last couple of things. Networking. Anybody in the room feel comfortable networking? How many people feel hideously uncomfortable? I don't know what to ask. I don't know what to say. I feel like, um, anyone? If you attended the session with Ollie Barrett, I hope you no longer feel like that. And if you haven't seen it, please go online and have a look. That man is a past master at telling you how to feel comfortable connecting with someone. But again, to the point about community, networking matters immensely building your company. Absolutely immensely. Question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I'm going to, uh, do you want to ask again? Yeah, the, these um, skills that yeah. you just outlined, yeah. are these skills that Wira will help cultivate in startups that may lack them, mm -hmm. or are they what you're expecting people to come in with right off okay. the bat? Okay, it's a great question. I would say both, actually, because in many cases, we get very different kinds of companies that come in. I do have single founder, no team, fantastic idea, good track record. Team of 38 people, Strong track record again, but very different style in terms of how they're going to manage and very different businesses. Each of them still needs help with this. So I expect some of these things to be there and I'll show you the list of criteria that Wira looks at when we evaluate teams. I'll actually share that with you today so you'll see how we judge teams. But importantly, these are the things we will work with you on. So we host sessions on networking. We actually make teams start networking literally from the day that they actually get to Wira. So on Monday, when the Wira Unlimited Academy opens and they go through boot camp, their afternoon is going to be spent learning how to pitch. Why? Because on Wednesday, we're inviting 130 mentors and board advisors, and the team's going to start pitching and networking immediately. They're also immediately going to start selling. They're immediately going to start communicating. So these things we start working on irrespective of where you come in straight away. It's a great question. Yep. Sorry. Go for it. Yeah, I was thinking about the this example about mm -hmm. this startup and the downloads yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And in terms of, uh, let's say you have an app and mm -hmm. you don't have a very very clear idea how to monetize and uh, if it's better to uh, launch it for free mm -hmm. and see how it goes and then I don't know charge for a premium mm -hmm. or or premium. even you are looking for a, com a bigger company that is going to buy it or mm -hmm. something like that. So it's really really important in terms of uh, applying for something like a program like Wira to have uh, a clear idea of, of the value and, and how are you going to, okay. to get revenues from your app, a, 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 a mobile app, for example. Yeah, it's okay. an interesting one because uh, the biggest pivot that I see is free, paid, free, paid, free, paid. And it goes back to this point of what's important to your specific business. And that business's question, it, they are trying to create a platform. So scale matters. So the number of users that they have using the platform matters more right now than necessarily charging but they wanted to see whether people had an intrinsic value attached to what they were offering. So initially, they started off by that. Now, they've just decided that they will go to a freemium model in the next month. 
So the point is you get to change your mind as you go along, and we often will find within weeks that people change their business models, their pricing models, their execution models. Their brand. That's okay. Their, their brand, brand name, anything. Everything. You know, the lovely startup world, we call it a pivot. You know, I love that we brand everything ourselves, but essentially what you're doing is you're testing, you're trying, you test quickly, you learn quickly, and you move. And, and, it's, and it's actually not, to my mind, it's not surprising that sometimes you start off with paid, unpaid, you get to scale, then you start charging again because you've got them locked in and it's sticky. So you'll find loads of examples like that across the piece. A great question. All right, a couple of last things. Research. You probably find that quite strange. But knowing your market intrinsically well, that you can answer any question an investor asks. Really understanding your market and continuously understanding your market, vitally important. And that's a hard one to do because you're so busy with your head down building. You're so busy coding. You're so busy selling. You're so busy going to an investor that very often that one gets left out. You throw some Gartner numbers up there. You say, hey, IDC said this. Gosh, my market must be worth 100 billion tomorrow. You know, I mean, those poor investors, you know how many times they hear that number and they all sigh? And then they start asking you serious questions about your background. Because what they want to know is, do you really know your stuff enough? It's research. You've got to do that. You've got to be innately comfortable with continuously being hungry for knowledge and understanding your market well and looking behind you to see who's coming next to you, behind you, where your next competitor is coming from. So it really matters. And then last two, finance, the other thing everyone hates. Keep control of the numbers. The numbers matter. And again, I will keep saying this. My view on numbers is it doesn't matter if the number is 5, 7, 15. I don't care what it is. Tell me the story of the number. That's what matters. How are you going to get to that number? The, the capacity with which you tell me that and the sense of control and belief that I have that you're going to hit that matters more about whether that's five or five and a half or six. But knowing that you keep an eye on the numbers every single day matters, that sense of confidence. If you're not comfortable with that, we'll help you. There are many people who can, but you have to get comfortable with telling the story around the numbers. And the last one on fundraising, I'll take a Q&A. Fundraising. It's an obvious one. But funnily enough, some people actually delegate fundraising. Some people delegate it, which I find quite odd. Because at the end of the day, you are the front person of your company. You're the one who lives, sleeps, eats, dreams, probably has baked beans and spaghetti instead of having real meals, you know, who is at the front end of your business. You feel more passion for your business than anything else. Why give it to someone else? Because you feel vaguely uncomfortable about going to have to stand up and do presentations. So fundraising is, again, a, score, a, a real core skill that we work with from day one day one with you so that you get comfortable with how to put together a deck, how to have a conversation with an investor, how to have confidence in your business, and be able to ask all the really tough questions. And I often will tell you, I spend time with some of the startups literally going through their entire business plan, all of their numbers, their investor deck, with my investor hat on. Because remember, we are an active investor, and I get to live with you every day in Waira. So I'm going to ask tougher questions. I'm going to go, why left? Why right? Why there? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you scaling over here? Where are you in 2014? Very different things. But we will work with you on this, but you have to get comfortable fundraising. Again, do not delegate that. You have a question. Um, going back to the question of a pivot. Mm -hmm. If a person applies to um, Waira mm -hmm. with a business proposition that you don't think will work in its existing form, mm -hmm. but you yourselves as judges can see that if it becomes this, it'll work. Yes. Can you accept a candidate on that basis? Okay. In other words, you, uh, with a business plan that they haven't seen, but you have. It's a brilliant question, because one of the core principles of Wira, and one of the great things we've learned with all that t over 200 companies we've worked with, is it's the person, and we invest in the person, as much as the idea. And if it's a crap idea or an idea that has a half-baked promise, but you are a brilliant entrepreneur that we can work with and we can turn that idea into something else, we'll absolutely take you. Because your ability to execute and your ability to have those core skills matters. And most, a lot of the businesses we've actually had a look at went, if you just take it here, if you just do this thing over here, have you thought about that market versus this market? And we work with you every day on that. But again, that principle above all else is you matter as much as your business idea. You. That's why these, these skill sets matter. You matter as much as the, the strength of your business. Because if you come to me with a great idea and I don't believe you can execute it, I will tell you we have turned down hundreds of teams like that. Because I do not believe that you can execute the great idea. So I'm not going to invest in you. It's as simple as that. All right. If you're a CEO, your shortlist is the following. Slightly different. Slightly different. 
But a couple of things. One, you are the vision. If you cannot stand up and tell me with passion and heart where your business is going and why, and why I want to buy into you and why people would want to buy you, then you cannot be the CEO. You have to be the front leader. The first one there is you have to have a strategic mindset, constantly thinking about that. Next one, insight. You really do need to know your market. The number of people who fail because when you ask them one depth question, you ask them one detail question and they can't answer it and you expect them to be able to answer it because they have insight, no? The number of people I see like that is actually really worrying. You must know your industry well. It comes with passion too. People management, we talked about. You've got to be great at sales and you have to relentlessly execute. The thing in the startup land that I see a lot of, and again, we call it pivots, someone else called it startup bipolar, which I thought was quite a funny expression, is that I watch teams not execute. And they give me a thousand reasons why they're not executing. And all they're doing is they're fiddling over here, and they're fiddling over there, and they worry about the font color, and they worry about this tiny little thing over here that may or may not make a difference to the consumer, and then they never launch. I just call it navel gazing. You spend your entire life staring down, going, but I could make it prettier. I don't care about making it prettier. Put it out on the web and go launch the thing. You have to be able to execute every day. You have to be pushing forward. You have to have the energy to do that. Stop worrying about the damn font. The consumers will tell you about your font. Believe me, instant feedback on the web. Hate it, love it, whatever. But that, you have to go. I think the other thing as well is focus. Mm -hmm. So all of those things are absolutely critical. The bit that I've probably kind of add there is you will get advice from 27 different people on the first day and another 400 people on the second day and it's, it's, it gets overwhelming. And there are so many potential different routes that your product could go. Um, you, know, you could take it to direct to consumers, you could white label it, you could sell it to a corporate. Pick something and focus on it. You can't do it all. But if you do nothing, you're gonna get nowhere, clearly. So stay focused get things out of the door, get customers giving you feedback. That's the most important thing that you can get because ultimately it's the customer who basically will tell you whether or not it's good or not. Okay. Hi. I, I have to put, oh, yeah, so go ahead, please. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> go ahead. No, I was just gonna sort of um, give an example on that as well mm. and it's probably my own example here. Okay. Um, I could have spent, well, sorry. No, I could have ahead. spent sort of days really thinking about the ideas and what I did was um, I just launched it and it was just a minimum product mm -hmm. and it was really really crap mm -hmm. but it got some of the functionality out and I was surprised when um, I shot it out to the venues and you know to photographers mm -hmm. and a lot of my suppliers and they were really receptive to the idea mm -hmm. because they could un they could see, see the it. functionality rather than the whole thing mm -hmm. and I mean so now we're, we're pivoting and we're pivoting mm -hmm. quite a lot but it's it's getting that engagement and I was surprised myself but mm -hmm. it was you know it's really nice to see when people are sort of backing you, mm -hmm. people in the business backing you. So it's, Great. Yeah. I mean, an, an example would be, uh, what is it, 12 weeks into the program, we, you, know, you normally have a demo day at the end of your nine-month period. Well, we decided to innovate ourselves. So we decided to show the investors our team 12 weeks in. And what we did instead is instead of them just pitching, they had to show what they've done so far and what they've achieved, which is where most of them are, in London in particular have already launched. Their investor feedback was incredible. Absolutely incredible. So instead of them seeing an accelerate at the end of nine months, they got to see at the end of 12 weeks just what could be achieved by putting it out there. Most of them had generated revenue. Most of them had signed up massive deals. They got to, and we had to do show and tell. Not enough to do a pitch deck. Show me your product. It had to be there. You had to be able to experience it. We had 235 investors sitting in a room. Most of you said to me, I hate going to demo days. I hate this kind of thing. I've not invested in a company in the UK for six years. And I have four companies right now that I'll cut you a check for because I can see what they're doing. I can see it. It's not a PowerPoint deck. It's not a PowerPoint deck. So very powerful principle. Relentless execution, focus on it, and get it out the gate. And then iterate and go. Last thing, last shopping list for you, and then I'm gonna, we're gonna move to talking about the startups. But this is the stuff that we expect you to see uh, one more question. Just a quick question. This is great, and thank mm. you. Yeah. How do you deal with the risk when you go early of mm -hmm. people ripping off your idea and executing faster than you? <laughs> You're always going to have that problem in business, always. So IP protection is an area that we're going to work on, and one of the things when we evaluate you is exactly that. What's the market going to do? Who's going to disintermediate you? How quickly can you keep innovating to stay ahead of the pack? 
And that's part of looking at that skill set that you have and the business plan that you have. So we're, and if you have to have those things initially, and I have to have a sense of belief that you have the energy and focus to make that happen and keep going. So part of our due deal really will focus on that. Hang on one second as well. Ben's got hey ben. to add. Uh, just on that kind of the, f the fear of someone taking your idea. Often you will spend all of your time trying to convince people that your idea isn't mental. Like on, you can kind of walk up to any big corporate in the world and tell them exactly how you're going to destroy their business mm -hmm. and they still won't listen. So just never ever worry, honestly. Yeah. It's just, it's this kind of concern that entrepreneurs dream up as an excuse to not actually achieve. So just forget <laughs> about it, crack on, crack you know, on. honestly. And when they copy you and you go and do it better than them, it's called competition. Get it out the gate and start running. Always. All right. Shopping list, which I won't go through, but this is the kind of stuff you're going to have to build. If you're going to be a serious business that people are going to invest in, get to Series A, get through all of those things, these are the things that should be on your list to create always. It's funny when, when teams come into an accelerator and we all say to them, write a business plan, they all go, why? Because okay, I'd like to know what you're going to do to get to that grand vision that you have. I want to understand the market forces. I want to understand how you're going to build your team. I want to see your financials. And I'm not being a VC and saying I don't want to see your financials in 2014 or 2015. I actually want to see how you're going to basically broker and architect your business. So all of these things are on this list, and I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but you have to have these. And it's surprising to me there are two things I always see missing. I see a business plan completely missing, and I see the investor deck a mess. Because people confuse a selling deck with an investor deck. Very different things. They throw their entire brochure, if they have one, throw some numbers at the back, a little bit of a team profile, a huge number for market opportunity, and they go, voila, there's my investor deck. Not so. Really, really not so. So we do need to make sure we spend time with you and that you work on that so it gets attention. Um, is yeah. You've obviously seen a number of different business plans mm -hmm. and investor decks for both Wira and Wira Unlimited. Yeah. Uh, was there a marked difference in either the style or the quality or the presentation across the different types of ventures, social and more sure. for profit? Social, uh, by their very nature, focused on social impact first. By their very nature, and also because that's a question that we asked them when they came to the judging day. What will you do that will benefit people in the United Kingdom and how will you let me measure that? And I have to tell you, measuring social impact is very, very hard, actually. It's very easy to measure money. It's in the bank, flows through, it's great. Social impact, that you, may, you change someone's life because of something that you've done, is harder and every single business will have a different way of measuring it because their business is different. So if you're helping people in the community who are disenfranchised and they don't have carers, which is one of the companies we've invested in, that's a different measure of social impact than the guy who is essentially creating technology that analyzes your skin lesions and figures out if you have cancer. How do you measure his social impact? So yes, they are very different. The classic core things that you will expect to see that are, un uh, to my mind, common across both are the numbers, the market opportunity, the team, what makes you special? What makes you special as a company and as people that I want to give you money for? Those things are common. And again, I'll show you what some of those criteria are. But the biggest difference is for social and for Wire Unlimited are social purpose. And the other one is pure play revenue. All right, last but not least. Um, I'm going to talk about two words that you're not going to see on your business essentials thing. That lovely textbook that you read that tells you how to do a business plan and shows you what the investor deck looks like. Da -da -da -da. You'd be amazed how much you matter when you're standing in front of an investor and how much your passion and your energy for your business matters above all. Because if you cannot stand in front of me and convince me that this is something that's going to work, yes, I've done your background check, that's great. But if you cannot walk in the room, excite me about your business, excite me about your team, excite me about the market opportunity, and then tell me you have the energy to go away and make that happen, really have the energy to make that happen, you're not going to get investment. So the thing that we often stand on stage and say to you is, bring your passion, bring your energy. Don't be afraid, and I'll take your expression, don't be so damn British. Being reserved is not going to work. I don't ask you to be a cheerleader and bounce into the room and go, hey, I'm here, all right? That's not gonna work either. My head just goes into, God, stop shouting at me. But bring your passion and bring your energy. It really, really matters in this industry. 
Because what it does is it differentiates you. And then I look at your idea with the same kind of fizzle of excitement that you feel for it. And I've sat in enough judging sessions right now to hear the following sentence. God, aren't they, they have a great energy and a great team dynamic? And aren't they great people? And aren't they so passionate about what they do? Don't you want to just work with them? That's the sentence that comes back. Don't you just want to work with them? Wouldn't that be fun? Business hard, idea needs some work, financials not great, investor deck not there, blah, 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 blah. But look at them. Look at them. Don't ever forget this. Stop worrying as much about the... You wor people worry way too much about the mechanics. They get nervous and they forget about this. And that stuff matters. Passion plus energy, please. Because energy is, can you actually go away and make this happen for me? Or for you. All right. So, should we get into what we look for? You want to know how I judge you? How we judge you? How independent judges judge you? How we go through all of this? So here's your magic list. Oh, and I'm going to unpack this list for you in a second. Opportunity size. I think size. that's possibly, by the way, the most amount of phones that's ever been brought out <laughs> in our audience all week. That's a good thing. And they're not taking pictures of me. It's the list, right? No, no, they you love sure? you. They love I, you. I, I just want to check. Just want to check. All right. Here's the list. Super important list. Opportunity size. Status. And I'm going to... Do you want me to unpack it? Because it matters, right? And the last one you really do want to know about. That magic thing. The secret sauce, as people like to call it. All right, let's start unpacking it. And then when I finish this, you're going to hear from a team that we believe does have all of these things and about how he got into Wira. And then it's your opportunity to ask us both questions about that experience before we wrap up. All right, so size of the opportunity. It's kind of obvious you have to have numbers. But here's the thing, people. Could you please make them believable? Because my eyes glaze over when someone starts giving me numbers that have so many zeros behind them that are articulated to one particular source with zero substance. And every, every entrepreneur in the world does that. They walk in and go, it's huge. You must invest in me. My next question is, yes, it's huge. And what are you going to do to capture that share? I get that the market's huge. I understand that. We all know that. All right, so we really do look hard at that. The next one we look at is, how quickly can you grow outside of the country that you're in? And for me personally, I have to say, if you tell me you're just going to do the UK, I'm not so sure. I, w I really do want world domination. So if you tell me initially you're going to do the UK, then you're going to own it, then you're going to go somewhere else, all good. But if you tell me that your entire ambition is only ever to stay here, that doesn't look like growth to me. So I really do look hard at where are you going to go beyond here. And then the maturity of the market, it's an obvious one. Is it hot? Is it really growing? Is it stagnant? You know, is it dead, in my opinion? Is it actually starting to decline, no matter what number you've just showed me? Those things matter. So that's the analysis. And we have experts who go through all of this stuff to look hard at it. Because I can't possibly be an expert in 17 different market sectors. I'd love to be, but can't. Status and maturity. Can you actually implement this thing? Where are you? Do you have MVP? Or are you literally just an idea on a piece of paper? And if so, do you understand development enough to quickly go and make that happen? We did have a team who just literally had that, a good idea. And we worked hard with them. In fact, the, the thing we said to them is, if you do not have four developers sitting around your table within the first month of coming into Wira, we will not give you investment. Sounds tough. Guess what? Three weeks in, four developers suddenly sitting there, idea being implemented. That's what you've got to do. So we look at where you are at stage and patents. IP, you talked about, can you protect my idea? Obviously matters, but also you've got to be careful in that space, right? So patents are expensive, IP protection is expensive, and actually what I'm also wanting to understand is how quickly can you keep innovating ahead and protect at the same time? You've got to be able to come in with both. All right, next one, strategic fit. It's a hard one. Jonathan actually uh, challenged me on this earlier. Said, what's strategic fit mean? To whom? So, well, there are actually multiple ways of explaining strategic fit. To Telefonica, diversity, the ability to see how that would fit in with the operating groups that we have. And the fact that we have 300 million customers who might want to buy your strategic fit is, will the consumers be interested, period? Is there something that's really fluffy, it's never going to make money, or is there some kind of strategic value behind it? I will tell you, we do not have some grand plan that says, I will only invest in this kind of company. No matter what shade of pink, green, whatever it comes in, we don't work like that deliberately. Because the value of investing in the number of companies that we have is that we get to see what consumers really want. Because they're all so different, these companies. You have a question? 
Going back to IP, mm -hmm. um, do you, uh, the people who get through to, to IRA, they get yeah. a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. If you believe their idea is unique, mm -hmm. do they get an additional lot of money to protect their intellectual property or does it have to come out of the okay. budget? This, uh, yes, it comes out of the budget. And I'll explain why. Because the amount of money that we give you is quite deliberate. It's deliberately not enough for you to actually sit back. It's just enough to keep you going. It's just enough to get you going. But depending on your IP, and that stuff can be hideously expensive, you need to go out and raise some capital. So the structure is not for us to just keep giving it to you. Now, if you have something that is so unique, and you remember those things are rare, but if you do, then we'll work with other divisions within Telefonica to A, analyze that and look at it, and then we'll talk about how we bring that forward. But so far, have we gone out and paid for someone's IP protection today? Not, not to date. Not to date. Not saying it can't happen, but it would have to be really rare. Really, really rare. And part of the psychology is, I want you to get out and fundraise. I want other people to get excited. I want people to go out and make this happen for you. So the amount of money is very psychological, because we could give you more. But we just give you enough to get you over that and then make you run and, and go sell and go and get investment. Right, strategic fit, we've gone through market risks and competition. That's what you talked about earlier. You know, are people already, is it a hot space that everyone, we don't really believe you can get around, through, over? Or is it actually, do you have something that actually everyone looks at and goes, damn, why has no one else done that? That's kind of obvious. It's a funny thing, but I sit in rooms and they go, why has no one done that? And those are great businesses. Great businesses. Because it isn't just about doing the same thing, just slightly more clever. It's a duh moment. Of course we would want to do that. Yeah, and I see a lot of businesses like that that we have actually gone and invested in. So, dependence from external partners is an important one. Can you do this thing on your own? Or how much help do you really need to go make that happen? It can be seen as a weakness, too. If your whole business depends on some deal over here that you haven't really cut, that puts you in a different space, that might be an issue. Might be. So it becomes a risk factor from us. So what we want to look at is, can you do this on your own? Partnership matters, yes, but how dependent are you on other people to execute? So for example, if you've never coded in your life, you have a great idea, you have no people on your team who can do that, and everything is outsourced. Everything is outsourced. And I look at your business, what's the first thing I'm going to say to you? Please bring some of that in-house when you can and when you can afford to pay for it. But please start bringing that closer. What I'm worried about is that you're just handing stuff out and you're going to be dependent on someone else developing for you which means you're going to spend your life in meetings asking them to hurry up and get going. And they're not going to be working at 3 o'clock in the morning like you will be because they're a business, another business. They're a service provider. And then current competitors, as we talked about earlier, really do matter. I'm not, but the thing is, we're not afraid of the competition. The point is, can you out-innovate them? That's where we want to get to. And the last couple of things, innovation. Innovation is not just about your tech. It also comes down to your business model. Are you going to go to market in a way that no one else does? So your tech can be great. It's a bit like you see I, a great pair of shoes. Fine, that's great. Is someone going to buy that in a different way? Is net Porter going to sell things in a different way? What's the business model to get the intrinsic product out to the market? You have to innovate both in business model and in what you're doing on the tech. It matters. And very often, people don't innovate on the business model. The classic business model is the following. I will put it out on iTunes. It will be fine or the App Store, I'll put it out. It's not fine. I'll build an Android product, I'll build something else, we'll shove it out there, we'll see what happens. That's not a bit, I want to, we really want to look at creativity around the business model. Entrepreneurial profile, in other words, you matter. Your background matters. At the moment, 30% of all the startups in Wiro, actually no, 50, sorry, 50% 50 of all on their second or third startup. Your track record and ability to make something happen really does matter. And then the last one, which is one that's really hard to quantify, which is why that passion and energy matters. What's the secret sauce that you bring? That you bring? You and your team, your dynamics, either your background. What's that thing that makes you stand out above all others? And the one thing I often hear about Wiro, which I really love, is they say, Wiro UK is filled with a huge number of characters. A huge number of characters. They're all sitting over there, by the way. So if you want to look, they're all over there. And believe me, they all have character. They have something. They all have something that's some kind of special secret source to them and their business that allows us to believe that they are going to go away and be hugely successful. And that's why I put the last one. It's hard to quantify, but when you've met someone and you know they're special and we've all had that feeling, go meet some of these folks. You'll know why we invested in them. All right. 
So that's the list, guys. A long list, I know. But the point is, this stuff is not easy, and it doesn't just take one thing. It is not enough to just have a great product. It is not enough just to have a great CEO. It's not enough just to have the right pricing. So the message here is, it can be complicated, and these are the things that matter. From our experience of looking at all those companies, and also, very importantly, rejecting more companies than I really care to. It's heartbreaking to reject them, but these are some of the reasons why we do. Because you cannot innovate, you don't have the right team, you do not, you're not defensible. Your business idea is not defensible. And I know that in a year or two, someone else is actually going to completely go around you and not buy you. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, it's a question about mm -hmm. the global thing and the location mm -hmm. of, of the startup. Let's yes. say I have, a, I have the team, mm -hmm. I have a, a project in development stage. Yes. Yeah. And uh, will you recommend um, apply for a, we need a, an accelerator like us. Like mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and do you recommend to apply for example in UK mm -hmm. or we are based in Spain for example mm -hmm. and, and Telefonica obviously Wira has a, yeah. uh, an yeah. academy in Spain yes it, should we apply in UK in Spain depends on on our depends on your focus on, that's it if you, you can be in Spain, we have lots of teams from all over Europe that are based in London and Dublin and elsewhere. What we will ask you to do is you have to incorporate in the country of the academy right. that you go to. And mm -hmm. we must, we insist that your whole team, wherever possible, comes with you. So that your team gets accelerated and your company and your idea get accelerated, not just one person. It's right. very hard for one person to get accelerated and then fly back home and try and train their team. It just cuts up the business too quickly. So you can apply wherever, and wh whichever call is open for you. Thank you. Cool. All right. I think the other thing I yeah. would add as well is actually you can, um, because the way that we do our call process, um, whichever academy has space at that particular time will say, we're in. Yeah. You can actually say, do you know what? I'm, I'd be happy to move to either Madrid, London, and Dublin. So you can say which cities that you'd like to go to. We're quite flexible on that. One at the back. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering about the the principle and the idea about like uh, fail fast and then succeed. Uh, that's Lean usually, startup, yes. Yeah, uh, it, the um, Bible, as they call it now, right? But that's a lot um, used when once you s you are in the startup. I was wondering uh, what effect does it have when someone pitches uh, Wire an idea and mm -hmm. Wire doesn't accept it. And a year later, the, the same person has go, gone around and uh, step aside from the idea and has another startup. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a good idea? Or, uh, good idea, no. Um, is it the good thing that this, uh, like, uh, where I think this person co is continuously uh, making new mm. ideas, thinking new products, or okay. is like, this person is here again? <laughs> 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 All right, it's actually funny. Um, we just had some teams who uh, applied at one point and we gave them some feedback. And by the way, we give you feedback if you're not successful. So when you get to the last wire a week and we choose our shortlist, and if you, let's say we have 20 teams and 10 of you don't, give in, uh, don't get in, we will sit down with you and tell you why so that you can keep changing and keep moving and keep growing. It's important to us that we give something back too. And uh, for us, one of the reasons why, for example, if you've gone into one and not been successful and you apply again, is because we haven't seen your idea or you change enough. And we haven't seen you act enough on the feedback that we've given you. So if you come back with a different business idea, that's okay. But if my problem was I don't believe that you can make that happen, then you're gonna have to demonstrate that to me first and then the quality of your idea. So, you, so it depends on the feedback you got. For some people, the feedback was, we like you, it's all good, but your idea is not great. But also, you're not great enough for me to take that idea and run with it. When they come back and they show me the same idea and they've only changed one element of that problem, they're going to get rejected again. So I would say, personally, try, try, try again. We do have teams that, in some cases, uh, have applied multiple times, and they will get in. Because what are you showing me? Passion, energy, focus, resilience, persistence, door closing. You're showing me all the things that I'm going to love about you as an entrepreneur. And you're showing me you really care and that you're going to make this happen. So yes, keep going. Hang on. Hiya. 
Hi. Um, can I ask you a question regarding a uh, business plan? Yes. When trying to give projections that are mm-hmm. realistic, how do you do that if the markets know and non-specific by that I mean you're trying to reach everybody because obviously you just said you don't want to see a million zeros. So <laughs> okay. The, you can show me a slide that says the market opportunity is this according to multiple sources. So don't show me one, show me multiple. More important than all of that is how much of that are you actually going to get, next thing, and do I believe that and show me your execution plan to get there. So the thing I tend to focus on more is show me the plan. Make me believe you have one. Some people call it an operational plan. I call it a strategic plan. But give me the sense that actually you're going to do that and that the numbers that are behind that mean that you're actually going to achieve that thing in your marketplace. So it's the story behind that that matters. It's stage three. I will tell you, your eyes generally glaze over at the number of big numbers you start to see. And the problem with you when you're pitching, and if I'm, the psychology of that is I look at you and I go, oh, here we go again. So I stop listening to page two. Then I start thinking, really, do I believe the rest of this? And then by that stage, I think you're three steps behind where you want to be in an investment. So show me something, quickly get to, here's what I have that will allow me to take this percentage share. And please don't tell me you're going to take 10% share in two years by executing a lean startup with only two people. You'd be surprised, but I get that. Can I also add as well, we've had a couple of startups who are truly innovating in a new space. So it's a completely new market. Mm -hmm. And so to your point, it's quite difficult to just kind of go, well, based on what everybody else has done, this is the size of the market. You're just completely launching a completely new thing that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Use things that are close enough Mm. to what you're building as examples. Yeah. And and be honest and say, look, this is a new market. So we're kind of having to guess a little, but we're making an educated guess based on other sources that we can see are similar in some way, shape, or form. Mm. It goes back to credibility. I think that's the thing. It's less the number. It's do you have the credibility for, me, for us and your investors to believe that you can execute that and that the number is something that I look at and I want to get behind. That's that point about what's the story. All right. Do you want to hear from an entrepreneur who got in himself? You want to hear about his experiences? Because I've given you the whole spreadsheet. And I know there's a lot there, and I'm happy to take questions throughout the rest of the session. But would it be useful for Ben, Jonathan to come up, talk a little bit about what it's like for you, for someone, if you want to come into Wira, experiences Jonathan went through, what we saw when we looked at that company, and give you a practical example of how this works. Helpful? Great. Jonathan, Ben, come on up. All right. Ah, you get round of applause. It's good. All right, let's go here. Am I on? Yes, you're on, I think. From what I can hear. Thank you. Where would you like me on this one? Where have you fancy? Oh, I like this, this is a good oh, one. After an hour of standing. Oh, awesome. yes. yes. I think the first key big thing is you need to introduce yourself and yes. explain your business. So why don't you very quickly give the again. elevator yeah. pitch of Excellent. what it is that you do to these beautiful people. Excellent. So, so we're actually building a, a global network of philanthropy supporting education. Um, And the way we're doing that, well, you've all heard of Kickstarter, I'm sure, or Indiegogo, crowdfunding. We're bringing crowdfunding into education. So we've built an open platform on sponsorcraft.com. You can go and use that to raise money for your projects. Any student worldwide can go and use that to raise money. But what we're also doing is licensing the platform as a software as a service to universities worldwide. And what that lets people do is tap into that enormous network of alumni of those institutions getting them to fund both those student projects, entrepreneurial activity, and innovation coming out of those institutions. Um, As a result, hoping to build a network around the world um, of of support for effectively education, educational projects. And the reason is that we we really think education is going to be at the core of of a stable, um, democratic 21st century society. And actually, that's one of the, the things I wanted to come on to, which is I I don't really see a distinction um, between a social venture um, and, and a for-profit venture. And I'm actually quite happy that Wire has begun to blur the lines a little bit. You know, I think in the 21st century, if you're not doing something socially useful, you might as well become extinct. I mean, you know, <laughs> so, so actually, I mean, that's kind of, that, that, that is kind of, um, that's kind of our mission. So that's a little bit about, a little bit about me um, and what we do. So, Good. yeah. Excellent. So you're, you're in the full way, the sort of the, the Wayra Unlimited or the Wayra Original. These, these, these yeah. terms become quite confused. It's quite interesting. So we actually applied for, for Waira, um, and then we applied for Unlimited's Big Venture Challenge. 
Um, and we found out we got into Wira, and then we found out some time between the two, we found out Wira and Unlimited decided to work together. Um, <laughs> And it was pretty confusing, but actually it worked really well. And um, I, I actually heard from one of the guys at Unlimited that they'd started to put us on their slideware, pitching to the cabinet office for the funding as an example of how you get, you know, you get these things off the ground. I'm not sure how true that is, but yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I actually think it's, it's obvious. It's a natural fit, yeah. but we're in the main wire. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what was it that, that I mean, you know, it sounds like a, you know, a fantastic stand up as well. business. Stand up. I think, good, well, good. yeah, you can either stand, stand or sit. It's up to you, but yeah. do decide, I oh. think. Um, <laughs> It's actually true. Standing up's much easier for energy. Yeah, so, it is. Yeah, absolutely, I do feel. What, what do we, we learn this week that if you act enthusiastic, you will be enthusiastic. enthusiastic. Excellent. Very done, good. done with Very almost good. no energy at all. I like that. that <laughs> well done. Well done. Good. Um, so, what was it that appealed so much about this idea? I mean, what, I mean, it sounds fantastic, yeah. but you know, without being um, rude. Is a lot, a lot of buzzwords in there. I mean, you know, where, where oh. is the sort of market opportunity? Where's the actual brutal relevance of, of investor? I mean, right. I'm not sure Dale Murray, would, with her business head on, would, would necessarily go straight in. Oh, Dale Murray would, believe me, and I'll explain why. Um, so Dale is a great friend of Wira, which is why I get to say that kind of thing quite as emphatically as I do. But there are a number of different things about what, what Jonathan just said, which are important. One, this is something that's new, that's in a different space from what people expect utilizing something that's quite hot. So crowdfunding is booming. You would have heard from Jeff, you would have heard, you'll hear this afternoon, you've heard about alternative sources of investment. You, so that stuff is happening. And that's a change in how people essentially look at businesses and their degree of engagement with funding and wanting to be part of something. So that's the first piece. The second piece was that I had literally just two weeks before read this article about just how much money Harvard Business School was sitting on as part of their alumni fund. And let me tell you how many billions that runs into. And I mean billions. That's one, one school who has got all this money that's come in, but it's all classic, I will cut you a check. Old school, very analog, go to a bunch of networking parties, da 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 da. It's incredibly analog. And the question then is if you automated that and reached out beyond the Harvard side, but if you did that in a way that engaged people with their alma mater, their school, because we all feel passionate about the school where we went to, but when you're getting a bunch of emails, it's kind of boring, and you don't know where that money is going, and you feel like it's going in a black hole, and you know, and unless you have time, you don't really press click, and then you've got to go to PayPal or somewhere else. It's just all too hard, and it just sounds like hard work, and you're busy, and you click the email down, and you forget about it entirely. So if you take crowdfunding, you take all this money that's potentially out there that we're not capturing, you take a technology platform that can make that happen, and you take an entrepreneurial team that has a track record and brings a huge amount of passion and understanding to that business, and you have a lot of those fundamentals I talked about earlier. So, you have somebody who's smart who's done it before. Dare I say it, he's on the stage. So I'm gonna say this again, and then I'm gonna absolutely deny I ever said it, and if someone shows me the video, all good. So he's smart, and he understands it, and he's done it before. His team is incredibly passionate, so he showed us part of his team. And you could see it, it oozes out of all of them. They just love what they're doing. They love this space and they know this space really well. They've got a great pipeline at the time when they came, a great pipeline of potential customers that they were going to deal with. Because that was my next one. Are you going to be in the UK or are you going to go beyond? This is the Dale Murray thing too. And very quickly it was all about international. It was all about, yes, we'll do it here, we'll prove that it works and then we're going to scale. Do you have the tech, is it ready to go? Yes, pretty much, ready to go. Okay, what's not to like in all of this? And within a couple of weeks of Jonathan joining Wira, he signed up his first three customers. He closed the deal. So this wasn't just I'm having cups of coffee with people. He closed the deal. So that's another thing. Don't come in and tell me, yes, I have this massive pipeline. You go, which deal stage are you at? And you very often hear, but I've had my first meeting. I can tell you, we, we rejected two teams basically on that basis. We said, that's not a pipeline. You've had a cup of coffee. That's not a deal. So he has all of those things that we talked about earlier, and in a space that's very hot, very growing, very interesting, and has heart. <laughs> it has yeah, heart. Actually, just, just on some yeah. of the numbers side, yeah. um, so at the moment, globally, about $50 billion is given by alumni to universities. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the percentage of alumni that comes from, it's about 5%. In the UK, it's 1%. In the US, it's about 9 or 10%. Mm -hmm. So if you think what you could, you could do by engaging the other 95%, you know, 
It, that's kind of where the real, we're, we're real players here. And every pound effectively that somebody has invested in our business is helping us to get unlock that money, which will then go into educational projects, which then helps them unlock more money and more social impact. So uh, it's not like we're just sat there going, right, we're going to charge you for raising money. It's actually kind of triple bottom line stuff as well, um, which, is, which is kind of where the unlimited thing comes in as well. It's where the social impact, where the social uh, enterprise thing comes in too. Mm -hmm. I think I mean, what, I, what I especially liked about that sort of pitch is I think that kind of really hits all of the things we've been learning about this week, which is, you know, there's a story, there's a passion, there's the money, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, you can see as, as Jonathan talks that there's a, you know, a, mini, a sort of a beginning, a middle, an end. There's a really clear purpose about that. And I think that's really key when you kind of, you know, when you're thinking about how are you going to present yourself or, mm. you know, to, to Shemaine later or Wayro himself, mm. think about those sorts of tales. You know, what is it you're trying to do? What's the big moonshot? And then where's the reality? I, I, have to, I have to tell you before you ask your question, mm. one of the things I love about Jonathan's pod, because you get to decorate your office in any way you like, and I think within, was it about 10 days of you moving in, he had this big exit sign, you know the one that you have that has the stairs, and people, his one says one billion dollars, and then the people, that, so that's his exit sign, and he put that up as a pure sense of here's my purpose, here's my mission, here's where I'm going. It's that clarity of thought and clarity of focus and a little bit of attitude in the middle of it. What's not to like, again? So these are the kinds of examples of the things you have to do to stand out. Because you can't just stand out at Judges Day. You can't just stand out on day one and coming in at boot camp. You have to continuously be putting yourself forward. Very important skill when you're coming in. Question in the front. <laughs> this is a better uh, odd question. Uh, you may yeah. seem, to a lot of people, looking at you and your presentation and the excellence of it, he seems a very high bar for what is a startup. Mm -hmm. So are most of your successful candidates, if you will, at this level? Uh, or is that, is, is, is that the expectation? I don't know. How much growth has there been? I'm going to do something. Becky, <laughs> come on up. What, what does hey. that mean? What does that <laughs> could be taken in so many ways. So instead of us answering that, how about we get Becky to do her two one minute pitch of oh, her wow, business? Oh that's so unfair. Put you on the spot a little that's bit. So but you're unfair. awesome, you can do it. That's so unfair. Wow, this really is on the spot. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm the CEO of BuzzMove and what we are developing is uh, Europe's first online price comparison and booking platform for home removals. Becky, so, pull it up here. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have moved at some point in your lives. It's something that really resonates with people and it's, it's an incredibly stressful thing to do. And one of the things you can't do right now, which sounds completely mental, it's one of those uh, businesses that Charmaine was talking about before where why has this not been done before? Um, you can't actually compare exact prices and instantly book your removal company. So that's what we're building and we're going to be launching in a couple of weeks time, which is really exciting. Uh, we've already closed a deal with uh, nine different removal companies, and we're going to keep going with that. Um, and then we're going to continue measuring, and um, in three months' time, roll out nationally, and really the world is our oyster. Perfect. Well done, you. I hope I meet the same bar as Jonathan. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> so, two well things done, about Becky, that. Thank you. Number one, genuinely, I completely just put Becky on the spot there. Thank you so much. I think you can tell just from that that these guys are super prepared at any moment to be able to just trot out their um, one or two sentences that exactly explains their business. Another thing that Becky did brilliantly just then though, was she didn't just tell you what her business was, she also told you about the progress she's made in a very short space of time to make you believe that not just is it a great idea, that she is absolutely believable in delivering it. So the second thing I would say is, I could do that to Brittany as well, but I'm not going to. But if you want to speak to any of the guys... <laughs> oh, go on then. Come on, Brittany. Come on, come Brittany. On. Come on up here. Right. Come so on, Brittany. Come on. This is another one of our teams, guys. Come on up. What this shows you, though, guys, is to answer your question, Paul, yes, they are all this good. <laughs> it's a competition. Hey, y'all. I, I, no, no, but I'm going to... I get it, and I will answer in a second. Brittany, go. Hi, my name is Brittany. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Songdrop, which is a way to listen to music from multiple sources. So you can listen to music from YouTube, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, Vimeo, Vivo, MP3s on blogs, and anything that's not behind a paywall, because paywalls suck, and so do ads, so we don't have those either. 
Um, we started Wiro with a product and we'd already launched and now we have an iOS app. We're just waiting on an update in the app store. And you can download it for free. And we're going to be building up loads of products that are about how you listen to music online. I think right now it's really boring that all you can do is play a song and that's pretty much it. We're interested in how you can actually change that and make something new out of the music that's there for free online. And okay. if you have any questions, please let me know. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Ben. So you, your question was, do they all come in exactly like this? Okay. And uh, the, the quick answer is not always. Because I think the, there's an interesting thing. If you go, you prep, you pitch. Your pitch typically to Wire a Week is about 10 minutes. Big clock. Standing in front of you, it is Dragon's Den. The thing, the clock starts ticking down. You start getting nervous. You've got slides behind you. And believe me, we stop you at exactly 10 minutes. You have to stop. So you've got that in the back of your head. High pressure situation. Then we start asking you questions. And it's all the questions we've already gathered before you even did your pitch. So we've read your bios, we've read your business plan, we've read everything. So you're coming into the room, we, the judges are very prepped to ask you a huge number of different questions. So what you get out of that experience is you get a certain bar. So I sit in the room and I watch all the teams and I go, that team didn't really answer the question really well about that piece, we need to develop that. That team is absolutely brilliant on presentation, has no clue really to my mind about how they're really gonna make money. But gosh, are they believable as an entrepreneur? That team is an obvious idea. We should be doing it tomorrow, and they have a great team dynamic. Let's go. They all come in at very different stages and as very different people. The thing we do within the first month is we put them through boot camp, basics, training, pitching, etc., so they can all essentially then come up to what is loosely the same bar. But the thing to remember about this is I'm not comparing one to the other because they're all in very, very different spaces. You've got crowdfunding and students, you've got moving and you've got music. You've got dating, you've got software as a service and cloud-based services and ISO 2000. You've got everything. So in some cases, you have to work with them on what is specific for your sector that would make you stand out. So we will work on that too. But the one thing that they all have in common and you have to have in common is that idea of I can do an elevator pitch like that. I love my business. I can answer any question you're going to ask me and I'm not going to feel that this is a horrible experience standing on stage. You've got to be able to do that at a drop of a hat because you never know where you're going to meet your next investor. You never know where you're going to meet your next business partner. You've got to be ready. And that's what all these folks are demonstrating is they're ready. C can I just, can I very briefly on that? <clears throat> no, I mean, none of us were anything like this when we came in. We've been in the program four months. <laughs> um, so you walk in with, you can walk in with passion and belief about your idea, but the number of times we've now been put on stage in the same kind of way, spontaneously like that, like we've had to learn how to do that. And, um, you know, and the businesses have, all the businesses have accelerated and all the presentation skills have accelerated. So I, I think it would be unfair to say people walk in at a really high bar. People walk in where they are. They come in with an idea and a concept. Somebody then believes in you and you develop as a result. Um, so, yeah. and, and that's something Wira focuses on a lot, is we develop you. That's why we make your question about who comes into our, we want the whole team, because we want the whole team to develop. We want the whole team to be accelerated. We want you as a person, in addition to your idea, to be accelerated. And you as a person could be anything from presentation style, to the way you think about strategy, to your understanding about numbers, to your idea on product. All of that stuff gets worked on in the period of time. And it's also why our accelerator is longer. Because you can't do that kind of stuff properly in three weeks, or four weeks, or five. They were, they've been in for quite a while. Learning, soaking. Yeah. So actually, just on that, I mean, yeah. you know, and I think just to kind of expand this point, which is, you know, where where were you, Jonathan? Where did you, you know, you, can you look back now and think, oh shit, like I was, you know, I was useless, I couldn't do that. You know, I'm kind of, and what is it that Wire has kind of given you? Can we, you can talk yeah. a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, when we came into Wire, we had one white label customer we'd had a meeting with. Um, so one university we'd actually talked to and had a meeting with. Uh, we had probably fundraised about £20,000 for student projects so far, globally. So uh, we had no money. Uh, I think we'd just run out. Wire's timing was perfect. Um, and um, yeah, we didn't have, we were based in Bristol. Uh, and we were basically just sat in this beautiful old office in Bristol, ticking along, thinking, yeah, it'll probably come off. We'll do a couple more meetings and, you know, we'll probably make some sales. Um, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely, it is kind of astonishing when I think four months ago, we were sort of, 
rocking into work and feeling like it was all okay, but we were running out of money at some point and we should probably do something with this. And occasionally tripping up to London and, you know, packing six meetings into a day. And of course, you're knackered by the end of it. Well, if I think about where we were and where we are now, we've got a pipeline of sales leads that is more than we can actually serve. Um, we've actually got a pitch that everybody in the team could deliver and believe in when they're doing it. And, um, you know, we, we've just, fingers crossed, we're about to close another big investment round. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is things that, um, it's all about actually a crystallization of the business. Because until, until you've got all those people on the outside looking in, poking you, prodding you, finding out where the weaknesses are, I'm just saying, look, why aren't you going and talking to 100 different customers? Like, why are you sat here in, a, in an office in Bristol just, just doing, doing what you were always doing before? Um, and actually, that, that was a real, real moment for us, actually. When, I mean, so we took this proposition of a white... I mean, I, I gave you a great pitch about, you know, kind of uh, what we do. That wasn't what we started doing. We've done a pivot as well. We did a crowdfunding platform for students. We thought that was going to be the be-all and end-all, and that was just going to work. Um, we went to our... Very early on, we went to a customer um, in Cambridge, actually. And I, we pitched them and said, you should tell all your students about this. It'll be amazing. It'll change their lives. It'll be brilliant. And they went, no. And I went, why not? And she went, well, it's brilliant, I love it, but unless you give me my own branded version of it, there's no way in hell I'm telling my students. Um, and we went, oh, we're not going to do that. Like, we don't want you to have a choice over the, the, you know. So for another year, we went and did our own thing. If we'd gone and talked to three or four more customers at the same level, we'd have cut a year out of our cycle. You know, in the end, that was the right proposition. It, it, you know, it has just as much impact. It has just as much social benefit. It has just as much value. In fact, it has a lot more value. Licensing a university its own platform. We didn't talk to enough, enough customers. And you need to have people around you just saying, go talk to customers. Go use that feedback. Go build that into your product. Uh, and actually, that's the core difference the Acceleration Program has made to us. It's just questioning the whole time. So. And a little bit of pressure. Just a little bit, because there's nothing like living with your investor who gets to come each day and go, where the hell is this team? And why are they never here? Which never happens a wire ever. Ever, ever. But no, genuinely, it's, it's a quite a unique environment to be in as an investor because typically you look at things from the outside, you're helping, but you don't get to sit alongside these people every single day, 24-7, 365 days a year because they really do work in you know, an incredible style. But that's a unique place to be. So the questions you start to ask are slightly different because you're there all the time watching and pushing and help. And the pushing is more less about my investment. It's about making them the successful company we know they can be. He's being very self-deprecating because the deal he forgot to tell you about is he's just signed with... Oh, yeah. Do you want to tell them? Come on, I don't want to steal your thunder. Which one? Blackboard. Blackboard. Which one? Listen to that. Sorry. I had one customer I was having <laughs> coffee with, wasn't really thinking. Now he's like, which deal, Charmaine? Which one do you want me to tell about? Go on, tell so, them about yeah, Blackboard. No, but, so Blackboard is the, is the it's a $2 billion NASDAQ company, I think. It's listed. Tiny, it's tiny. amazing, basically. They do, they're do. the biggest provider of CRM software to fundraising uh, teams for nonprofits, charities, universities in the world. And um, they actually called us about three months ago and said, right, our, two of our strands are, we need to do online, uh, online payments and we need to do community building. Um, so can you have a chat with our director of innovation? And we went, yeah, okay. So I went up to London, met them, and you know, we've just signed a sales deal with them. We're starting UK and Europe. They're doing referral sales for us. Um, Actually, <laughs> yeah. tiny deal, no? Yeah. Tiny deal. Two billion NASDAQ listed company. We're going to go global. Small. I was sitting in Bristol having cups of coffee and yeah. occasionally thinking about running out of money. Yeah. I don't know if that's a pivot. I just think that's called success. Well done. Yeah, it's, no, cool. it's fantastic. It's cool. I really think there's well quite a few questions loitering around, certainly for yourself, sir. Yeah. We'll start with you. Um, my question is actually to you, Ben. Um, I believe you've been <laughs> through the process of Wira. No, you haven't. No. Uh, right. I was just going to ask them, what yeah. input do you still have once the company's been through Wira? Mm -hmm. So when I put that number up of the 200 odd companies, 265, if not more, we maintain a share in them. So we've actually bought an equity stake in you. So it's not a case of you come in, we give you space, we give you mentors, we give you board advisors, we you know, help you out with your business, etc. We actually have a stake in you. And in some cases, that can range anything from 5 to 10%, depending on where you're at in your business and your valuation. And then some of those businesses we will have a more active engagement in when you leave Wira, because that's something that's mutually beneficial for both of us. The important point for us is we do not want to manage your company. We want to be an investor and a good investor. And a good investor is a supportive investor who also asks you tough questions, and he wants you know, your business to grow. 
So we don't have one big massive exit plan in place or any of those good things. What we do want to do is build sustainable businesses. By that I mean businesses that are not just going to be here for a year, maybe two, and then flame out. So we will have an engagement with you post wire. We'll decide what that engagement looks like because some businesses need more. Even after the nine month period, they're going through a high growth period, they want us to come and help negotiate deals with them. I get those kinds of requests too. You know, it depends on the business. Uh, what we try and do though is keep it light on overhead, light on admin. Because what a lot of ad investors will do is when you've gone and left an accelerator, they'll ask you for endless reports and endless things and KPI dashboards and you spend your life reporting out to various groups. What we tend to do is I'd rather just go to your board meeting occasionally. See how you're doing, see how my investment's been managed, and then figure out if I engage more later. The other thing we do do, guys, is if you have gone through Wire, uh, you are always part of the family. So you have to come, you get invited back for the events, the speaker programs, the parties, the whatever, it doesn't matter, because again, it's this point of creating a community. And a lot of the companies in this group right now are learning from the companies in the previous group, and the previous group are learning from them. So we really, we don't just say, thanks, it's been beautiful, nine months, please leave. We continuously are making sure you come back in, you mentor, you advise, you work together. So we're creating a huge, a huge community ourselves. Very important to us. Um, my question is around collaboration, sure. um, particularly thinking around uh, Wire Unlimited. Mm -hmm. And the appetite, I don't know if it already exists, between other companies working with Telefonica. You talked a little bit about um, support or expertise that potentially is in-house at Telefonica yes. and available. Yes. Other businesses, other commercial businesses coming in and partnering with Telefonica in that way to provide that expertise and support, does that happen? Is there yes. appetite for that? There's huge appetite for that, actually. And I think that the number one thing that we say is we want to make sure, no matter what we do, third parties, other corporates, I don't mind. The single most important thing for me is do you add value for the startup? So our whole focus is on value creation for the startup. So we do get lots of people who, you saw the space, they just want to come out and hang out a wire. But they want to come and meet a few teams. And it's this goldfish bowl thing of, startups are cool. Let me come and hang out. It'll be great. And maybe I can be a board. We stop a lot of that. We say, hang on a second. You have to come in with a clear value add and value proposition for the startups in general. Then, absolutely, we open the doors. And we will use everything that Telefonica and O2 has at their disposal to make that happen. So we have a huge number of corporates that are coming in to learn about what we're doing to figure out how they help. Some of the biggest brand names in the United Kingdom are currently working with us on exactly that. We make them meet the teams, the teams get to pitch to them. So if you think of one of the gr biggest retailers in the country who's probably in the press every two days, their CEO's down meeting with people who are working on the payment side or meeting in people in distribution. Those meetings you would never get. You'd generally be dealing you know, four or five layers down. But because of the interest of companies looking at what Wire is doing and what Telefonic is doing, we're able to facilitate you meeting with the CEO who immediately turned around to his team and said, go make this happen. You've just cut through six months of sales cycle and layers. He said, go make it happen, work with them. So they do that. We also work with them on uh, things like Amazon will come in and offer you know, space in the cloud and all kinds of discounts and deals. So we want to make sure that we offer as much help and assistance on every level with all kinds of big brand name companies. So I think actually, <clears throat> yeah. On that point about Amazon, mm. Wire actually undersells a bit some of the deals it's got. Um, they, yeah. they, basically, when we applied for it, we didn't realize there's $10,000 worth of free AWS credits. Now, I mean, that actually adds up to quite a lot. Um, mm. And, uh, and so, so it's kind of, there's probably a whole load of stuff like that. Um, that I think it was kind of, this is only the second year in London, right? Mm -hmm. so, so actually, they're, they're building this program around some of the, the financial side of things as well. I just wanted to say on the, on the sort of brand and helping and the big company side of things, it's also about the people. So, I mean, we've had the, I think the head of brand for O2 helping us with our brand architecture. Um, and as a result, they may well end up investing in some way in our business. So um, there's kind of like a, not O2, but then put mm -hmm. on a personal basis. Uh, and I think that's somebody that you just could not have gone and met. It doesn't make any, you wouldn't have even gone and met them. And, and I don't need O2 in that respect to help me. I need that person to help me. And um, so some of the relationships that have been, been built there are quite amazing. Mm. Um. We probably have a celebrity or somebody else who's important in business literally coming down every single day. I think my tour of, of Wire I can now probably do in three minutes. I know what things they resonate with. And I also know the most important thing is for them to meet the teams. But the thing is, we're not actively going out asking these people to come to us. They're asking to come in. And it's great because, personally, they can inspire the teams around them. They get to see these folks who are interested in what they do. But very importantly, they're adding value to the teams. 
And that's the biggest thing. We go back to this point of, does it add value for your company? Then I'll do it. Fundamentally do it. I don't mind. And I think as, as an outsider, I mean, mm. someone asked kind of, have I been through the system? I'm, I'm, I'm just a waiver friend, as a supporter, a sort of champion mm. of, of, of the system. And mm. I'm a startup guy. I hate massive, gigantic organizations with a passion. If you are bigger than five people, I probably hate your company. Um, I like little tiny hustle and hackers. Yep. But what has been so fantastic about what Telefonica and O2 have done is exactly that, which is that ability to get in front of the CEO, the ability to spread the word. And that is so key. Like, you know, you can build the best business in the world, you can build the best product, you can build the best team, but you still can never get the meeting with the CEO. You still can't get the big connection, the big thing that you need. And sometimes it takes six months, and by the time that six months is in, you've run out of money, you've fallen out with your co-founders, your product has died on a shelf somewhere. And that's just life. And I think they've done a fantastic job in kind of accelerating that cycle and really doing good and using the power that a big corporation has to really accelerate startups. And that is actually, it's actually fucking hard, pardon my language. It's really hard for big brands to be awesome because they just kind of forget. They're just these gigantic, monolithic robots stamping on people. And I know that because I used to work for government, which is probably the biggest brand <laughs> that stands on more people than anything else. So... Um, <laughs> More questions. That's true. That's true. Um, more questions. Hi. So I guess from what I've heard, I mean, there was you had a project before this. Um, so I guess you know what I wanted to know is what have you learned along that way? What have you learned from the first project that you've taken on board to this? Mm -hmm. Great okay. question. Great. Question. I, I've screwed up a whole bunch of startups. Um, <laughs> so. And that's yeah. a good thing. That is a good thing. I mean, I basically, I, when I left uni, um, actually the first kind of startup I screwed up was quitting my PhD. So uh, I, I was trying to do a whole bunch of other stuff whilst I was there. I've tried to get everything off the ground from um, web startups. I tried to build Dropbox before Dropbox. I tried to build um, some, I, I did PCB design for a bit. Um, I, I kind of got bored of startups, went to RBS, did three weeks, quit. Um, so basically, there's a whole, I mean, I've actually never had a kind of real job. Um, I've just done startup after startup, and I'm 29 now. I started Sponsor after 27. So, uh, and by that time, I think if you go back and look on Judeo, you'll see quite how many failed startups there are because there's like you know 12 or something. Yeah. I've yep. tried. But basically, uh, the project before this um, was the one that made me really realise uh, what's important, which is having something real to sell. Um, and mm. you know, it's very easy to have a dream about some gigantic way you're going to revolutionise some sector. Actually, that's really, really hard um, because you're selling to people who have established patterns of behavior. And you, you don't want to be a revolutionary most of the time. You want to be evolutionary at best. Um, and actually, what you really just want to do is solve a very specific problem. So the startup that I did before this that was reasonably successful was... Um, uh, okay, so I did... Um, I, when I was at uni, I used to play loads of rugby. I got injured. Uh, and I couldn't do anything for six months. I was on crutches, and so I basically just stood in the bar playing table football all the time and drinking. So it was literally like I could hold the bars. So I basically before this, um, so what I did was I eventually I'm too competitive, so I started playing really seriously and uh, started playing for the national tournament. So now I play for Great Britain, and I was pumping all sorts of money into yeah, yeah I was pumping yeah. all sorts of money into the game. I was spending about two grand a year just going to international tournaments and the World Cup and things like that. Um, so actually, uh, I realized that I should probably do something to make this a bit less expensive. And I did a startup to, to try to import and distribute tables and operate them in pubs and clubs around the UK. And that taught me basically everything I know really about running a startup because we had to bring tables in from China. Uh, which meant dealing direct with manufacturers, importing them through Europe. It meant basically dealing with big uh, pub chains. Uh, I mean, think about dealing with Michelin Butlers and things like that and distribution ag ag agreements. It, it meant actually dealing with a major high street retailer. Um, uh, and and, and we, we built that to the biggest dedicated table football company in the UK, um, which was awesome. We have, I think we still have 250 tables in pubs and clubs around the UK. Um, but basically, I had something real to sell. There was a table. I cared about it. I cared about the game. And I understood the game and I knew something about the market. Um, and that was the first time I'd had the whole kind of joined up, right? So I knew the market, I cared about it, I knew the various players in it, and I could learn all the rest. You know, you can learn import, you can learn distribution, you can learn sales deals, but if you've got to really know the sector and care about it. Um, so yeah, that was, that was what I did before this, yeah. 
So what you've learned there is entrepreneurs are relentlessly competitive. <laughs> uh, they do nothing by halves ever. There is no such thing as it's good enough ever. And we now have a table football table in our office in Wairo, which Jonathan has, has given us. So, yeah, we, I mean, all good. Uh, yeah, we, right? haven't, we haven't decided whether they're buying it at the end <laughs> yet. <but. laughs> we'll negotiate, Jonathan. <laughs> we'll negotiate. <laughs> they're a big company. Make sure you add a bit on. Um, <laughs> there must be more questions. Come on. Uh, I'm going to go stop with you in the blue, sir. Um, I just wanted to know whether um, if you start with one person and you get into the accelerator, whether you can then, if you realize you need more technical skills or something like that, you can find other co-founder and they can join yes. the program as well? Or? Yes, we have, example, uh, we have an example of that person right now, actually, in Wire, who came in, I was telling the folks earlier, uh, came in as a single uh, person with a great idea, with uh, development that was essentially completely outsourced, which we thought was a bit of an issue. We wanted them to a, go fast to get it out the gate, and we also wanted them to essentially develop their company quickly. So we loved the founder, though. We loved the idea. It was very clear that people weren't, be, weren't going to be able to copy it, that they could go out the gate really quickly. So the challenge to them was, we're going to bring you in. And I'm telling you now, you have a month. I want four developers sitting around your table. Let's go. So they haven't necessarily found a co-founder yet. What they have found and built is a very, very good team of people they're comfortable working with. And their acceleration cycle for their product was this long, it's now here, and they're getting it out the gate. So we will definitely do that. The issue with that typically though, and I will say this now, is you have to have a track record, you have to have something really unique that makes you stand out, and I have to believe you can build a team. Because typically what we do know is it takes two. So we, t so we will look harder at someone who just comes in with one idea, because I worry about can you build a team quickly enough in addition to doing multiple processes in parallel. So we will look at that business hard, yes, of course, but we will absolutely take you on board. And we've had lots of successes with that. So um, Waira won't build your team for you? No, like, no, ever. no, um, no, you know, because we don't own your company, so yeah. we can't. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to, I mean, and, and hiring technical people, uh, if you haven't tried it before, is really hard. So, you know, um, try and get at least three or four people that you are interested in working with lined up before you approach these guys because you know it, you can't come sort of come in and expect suddenly to have a team of developers working for you it's, extre it's extremely, extremely difficult hard. Um, one of the great things though is and that sense of community that we talked about earlier when we get the teams together in a thing we call the mark uh, agora which is our marketplace or meeting place it's the team meeting and we actually say to people, one of the, you have to come to that meeting with an ask. And the ask from a team could be, do you know any good developers? And you start to use all the other companies around you because that kind of reference point is far more powerful than anything you're going to read anywhere else. And you'll find that people can close their recruitment loop far quicker because I'm getting a direct referral from you than someone I trust and someone I work with. Even if it's someone who just wants to come in for two weeks or three and who can help you quickly cycle through a prop, we get that almost every day. Excellent. Hi there. Hi. Um, my question is, have you encountered a company that enters the program um, that culturally doesn't really enjoy being surrounded by 10 other startups? It's a brilliant question. Uh, part of the due diligence that we do before you get to Wire a Week. So let me explain the process. You apply. So these 20,000 companies apply. We then get uh, teams of experts who go through your business plan, they go through your IRP, they go through your legals, they and they go through an algorithm of whether you even filled in the application form correctly. They go through all of that, and we get a long list that gets spat out, and we start to then give you marks and points on how you are doing. Then we bring you, so we bring that list down very quickly to about 40 teams. And then we bring you into Wira, and we interview you directly, and we do actually an, an HR interview. So we have HR experts in the room, and the questions we start to ask are, are you comfortable in this environment? Where is your team dynamic? How do you, how do you handle conflict? Have you ever failed? How do you deal with failure? Because by the way, we pri I think it's an important thing. You have to have had, you've got to have some kind of failure. You've got to learn. You've got to have some calluses. Everything can't just be rosy. I worry about people who come in and say, I never failed at anything in my life. They don't belong probably in Wire, quite frankly, because I'm not sure I believe them. So we test in that moment the, th the idea of community and can you actually work in that space. And we have had discussions about some teams where when I look at them, I'm just saying, you know, my radar goes off and I go, you're never going to like this because you won't contribute. So we start to test and we actually ask those questions. I had two teams where I asked the CEO that question of would you give your business, the investor comes to see you, he's not right for you, what do you do? And he said nothing. And the next team said, I give the business card to the team sitting next to me. Which team do you think got into Wira? 
So any person who walks in and says, it's just this, I'm in, interested in no way, shape, or form in dealing with everyone else, I want some quiet space with my head down, and I'm not going to talk to anyone else, I'm just going to go and build my business, which I understand, that's fine, but they don't belong within Wire because they will not go through that acceleration cycle. Because what it says to me is, you're not going to listen to feedback, you're not going to listen to advice, you're not going to take on board the community aspects that we know make you successful. And we know they make you successful. There's a follow-up question. Yeah. Does, I, I completely yeah. am with you on yeah. all of this. Yeah. Um, I think, is there ever a, a situation where there's kind of too many Indians and not enough chiefs? You know, you've got, you're getting too yeah. much information from too many people and it's just like, who do I listen to? And... Um, that's great. Everyone's got their own, you know, stuff for you. Oh, you'll have that almost all the time. I think that's one of the. Uh, can we yeah. take that? Yeah, you can actually. Becky, yeah. Do you want to do it? Yeah, go for it. Don't, no, don't <laughs> mimic him. You should be, please be your own person. Do you want to <laughs> answer? That's the hardest thing about the program is knowing who to say no to. They bring hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in, and it's more people than you'll have ever met probably before in, in your in business, your and you have to figure out. Um, Actually, 95% of them, this is not a reflection on the people why we're bringing in, but 95% of them aren't even remotely relevant to your business. 4% um, of them are going to be relevant to you, but massively distracting. And 1% of them might actually be useful. Um, and that's... No, not might be, are oh, useful. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh. But... And I'm going to challenge your, your, your numbers, numbers in a second. In a second. I always exaggerate it. numbers. It's, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, so basically, no, but you, I mean, that filtering process is something you have to, you have to learn. Um, and you probably haven't done it, most people haven't done it before. It's basically figuring out who's actually useful. Um, and actually, um, probably before I get challenged, um, the, the f the learning how to identify who is and isn't in important is a still an enormously valuable skill. So even if you find it extremely hard and distracting um, for a bit, it's still worthwhile learning how to do it. So, you know, actually, Wira for us, month one was a decelerator. But so far, it's actually taken us um, three, four, five times where we were before. And I think that's probably going to be similar for most people. When you get there, it's going to slow you down a bit. You have to move your office, your team, your city. You have to move your thought process. You have to move everything. And they're going to throw a whole bunch of people at you. But actually, what happens when you take somebody and you shake them up a bit is that they come out much, much stronger with a whole bunch more skills. And that's what's actually happened to us. So, On the sort of Indian chief thing. I think that's a very, that's an excellent point. It's, it's actually a point you will face as an entrepreneur anyway, that kind of, who do I work with? Who do I listen to? I actually, just this week, I met someone who <coughs> is an investor exactly in the space I want to be in. He has 15,000 potential customers that I don't have, that I need. But I didn't like him. I just didn't like him. And I didn't want to work with him. And I thought to myself, I can either kind of be nice and sort of give him the sort of, you know, little frot under the table, but... I thought, I don't want to work with you. Mm -hmm. So I just said, you know, actually, I don't agree with some of the points you've made. And I, I, I was very rude. And my mentor was, was kind of like, well, at least you're honest. Sent him an email saying, thinking, shit, I've really fucked this up. Sent him an email saying, let's do a JV, 50-50, your customers, my idea. Didn't hear anything. Didn't hear anything. Didn't hear anything. And then he turned around and went, yeah, I loved how honest you were. That was amazing. Let's work together. And it is that kind of thing which you just have to always... As an entrepreneur, I think, be the sort of ultimate fusion of massively honest and a huge bullshitter. And between <laughs> the two, you will succeed. Because you've got to believe yourself and you've got to make others. But then you also you've got to stay completely honest to what you're trying to do and not get sort of distracted by all the sort of great people that Charmaine okay. will introduce you to or others. So that's my top no, little... No, I think it's true. I think at the end of the day, the Chiefs and Indian thing is all about stay true to yourself. Stay true to yourself and stay true to the plan. And if we're going to introduce people to you, uh, one of the things we do go is what's relevant? What's relevant to you? So we, even when we start to talk to you about board advisors and we talk to you about mentors, the challenge we give back is often the teams will come in and say, I want this rock star guy, lady over here, because they have this huge title and if they're engaged in my business and that'll be amazing. And the thing we come back to is, no, but what's relevant for you? Where you are right now, it can change in six months. I'll introduce that person to you and I'll find your rock star. That's fine. But we really try hard to focus on you and what's relevant to you rather than just swarm you, you know, with hundreds of thousands of people. The networking part, which we have these events and you have all these folks there, the trick in the art is to try and connect the dots because those people might not be relevant for you now, but they most certainly will be later. And that's another thing that you can. You start to build a very, very impressive network of people 
that could be about your company today, your company tomorrow, or maybe about you later. So that's another thing to look at, is you don't always have to listen to the advice, but you are looking at them going, well, I could be, that could be really useful six months, one year, two years hence. Keep your eye on that. Okay, guys, we're going to yeah. have to wrap there, sadly, oh. because the, the main stage is on at 12. If you do have questions of Charmaine, of Jonathan, of any of the Wire team or the Wire startups, we'll stick around here. But before we do wrap, at the beginning of the week, I said that for one lucky startup, we would give you a fast track into the semifinals of Wire. The condition was that you had to attend all or most of the sessions this week. So I know who those people are because I remember your faces. <laughs> <laughs> if you are still interested, all you need to do is stay back and have a chat to me for a couple of minutes after the end of this session. So once again, thank you, Charmaine. Thank you, Jonathan. That's thank you, pleasure. Becky thank and you. Um, Brittany as well. Yes, Sorry for picking thank on you. you. Um, and don't forget as well this afternoon, two till four, Wire is not the only accelerator in town. We're bringing you some other options. So you can talk to the team from Techstars, from Seed Camp, and now also, hot off the press, Mozilla as well. All good. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Just because I enjoy correcting Anne, if you do want to speak to the Wayra team, we're not going to be here because this will be full of people doing keynote crap. We're instead <laughs> going to be over at Wayra Street, which is in that corner over on the other side of the Archimedes stage, which is full of interesting startup-y people, and you can get a, a much better sense of Wayra. So yes, Brilliant. listen to me, not to Anne. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks very much.